Hey everybody, Ridley back again. We're going to talk about arc lengths and curvature. I will tell you this is a very um, formulaic section. It's going to be a lot of formulas. I'm going to leave some of the formulas up to you guys to prove. In fact, I'm going to leave most of them up to you guys to prove, and I'll give you guys some opportunities for extra credit when we do so. Okay? All right, so let's recall what arc length was from Calc 2. If you recall, it was the integral from a to b of the square root of dy over dt, this guy squared, plus dx over dt, this guy squared, dt. Right? Now, think about this. It, I mean, if... In three space, with four space with t, all we have to do is just extend that out. So I'm going to get the integral from a to b. I'm going to go dx over dt squared plus dy over dt squared plus dz over dt squared. dt, put square root over this guy just like we, we saw before, right? And we're good to go. We're all set. All right. Now, look closely at what this guy is right here. What is this integrand? Well, I see the square root of a bunch of stuff squared, and I start thinking about magnitudes of vectors. Which magnitude? That's supposed to be a t, by the way. Eek. All right. Um, which, which vector? Well, remember our r of t? r of t was just x of t, y of t, z of t. Right? Now, I realize that we wrote this as f of t, uh, g of t, and h of t. But if you think about how it's written, it, there, these, these letters are arbitrarily chosen. And this is in the x direction, this is in the y direction, and this is in the z direction. I also know that r prime of t is equal to x prime of t, y prime of t. Remember the derivative of the vector is the vector of the derivatives. z prime of t. So what a handy mnemonic, right? And the magnitude of that vector, this is just pre-calculus stuff, is equal to the square root of x prime of t squared plus y prime of t squared plus z prime of t. Squared. So look at that. Hush my mouth. What are we really looking at then? We are saying that the arc length is equal to the integral from a to b of the magnitude of r primed of t dt. That's all it is. Nothing to it. All right. Now we've also let's let's not get away from too much here because some of those echoes of calc two may be resonating with you. Remember what this guy was? This guy was also speed, wasn't it? Back in the day, it was speed. So we're going to plant that seed. We're going to keep it in the back of our heads. But I need to give you a little bit of notation here. Because um, when you're dealing with the arc length, it's going to have a lot of repercussions down the road. All right, And especially, it'll be helpful for you guys to, to see some of this notation for when you prove those formulas that I spoke about earlier. We're going to define s of t as the integral from a to t. All right, This is starting to have sort of a fundamental theorem of calculus. Um, feel to it of r prime of u, the magnitude of that guy, du. Now, we got to be careful. Remember, these are dummy variables that always have to match up in the integrand. This is the independent variable. So you give me a t, I stuff it into the integral, and then I take the arc length at that point. It's just a notation. All right. Now, this, as you can see as well, I know that s prime of t this is just going to be the arc length function as prime of t, the integral, according to the fundamental theorem of calculus, the integral, uh, the derivative of the integral is the integrand. So out spits this guy. Lots of new notation. This is where you're going to want to take that Sharpie and write it down on your mirror at home or on something good that you can use. Okay? So uh, s prime of t is also equal to the integral, whoops, I'm sorry, is equal to the square root of square root of dx over dt squared plus dy. So these are going to be interchangeable, and you're going to want to make sure, and this is plus dz over dt squared. Oh, you know what? You guys got to yell at me with that. I guess you can't yell at me when you're watching videos. Remember, s primed of t has to be r primed of t, which gives me 
this guy. Sorry about that. Got a little lazy there. Okay. Now we have a way to solve for arc length in three space, four space with a parameter. Arc length is really, really important when we start talking about a phenomenon called curvature. Okay. And what curvature is, is, well, let me, let me draw something here. So this is going to be X, this is going to be Y, and this is going to be Z. And then I'm going to have a curve. I'm going to have a curve passing through space time, right? Here we go. Sure. Like that. Now, if you recall, let me go back to my black. If you recall, T is, if, if I'm looking at T of T, this was the unit tangent vector. And it was R prime of T, the rate of change of the vectors, divided by the magnitude of the vector. Remember, that turned it into the unit. Right? And what did that give us? That gave us a series of vectors that was explaining the behavior of the curve, right? Vectors like that. Whoop. And if I'm sure, now notice, your spidey sense may already be tingling. You may be going like, okay, wait a sec. If we're talking about curvature, this is far more quote unquote curvy here than it is here. So we should have a measure of that. We should have a measure of the magnitude. But before we talk about that, just, as a, uh, just to give you some vocabulary, let's talk about a smooth curve. A smooth curve, curve, and we're going to see. Remember how I spoke about C as being the set of all points that define the curve? A, a, a curve is smooth if, so let's go C is smooth. And this is going to be if and only if R primed of T is continuous and r prime of t is not equal to zero. We've discussed a little bit what r prime of t equaling zero is and what it does, right? It makes it's it's the vector equivalent of just sort of having. Remember, r prime of t is the rate of change of that of that overall um, vector. So we we're looking at making sure that this guy. Is, is constantly in change if we want it to be smooth, all right? Okay, cool. So we've got a smooth curve. We're, now we're going to talk about curvature. If I don't have a smooth curve, it doesn't make any sense to talk about curvature. It's kind of like if I don't have a continuous function, it doesn't make any sense to talk about derivatives, okay? That's sort of the, the uh, three-space equivalent of that. Okay. So the curvature. Now let's look at this bad boy. Curvature has this funky little K. I don't know how I'm going to do that. I think I'm just going to make a K because I, I, I kind of suck. Curvature is a scalar. It's a number. All right. And it is defined as dt over ds. It's the magnitude of that. That's why it's a scalar. Now let's look at that. Let's, let's just look at this sort of algebraically. This is the rate of change of the unit normal vector. Okay. It's the rate of change of the unit normal vector. But that in and of itself doesn't tell us, it doesn't tell us how curvy it is. So what I have to do is I have to take dt, whoops, I have to take, sorry about that, I have to take dt over dt, the derivative of this guy, okay? And then I have to multiply that by dt over ds, which is exactly the same thing as dt over little dt over ds over dt. Now, I know this is true by chain rule. I know this turns into this by chain rule, and that's what I get. So what does that mean? Well, it's the rate of change of the unit as a ratio or divided by the rate of change of the curve itself. So as this unit tangent vector is moving and changing, we also want to know what the what the curve itself is doing. Is the curve, is it changing over a long arcing swath like this, or is it changing quickly? So it's the rate of change per rate of change of the curve itself. And that's what curvature is defined by, which kind of makes sense in my head. Okay? Now, there's a couple of other ways to define curvature. And these are going to be, the, oh, wait, 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 based on, there's a little, there's something else that I want to do right here. If you look at this and you algebraically look at, at, at 
these definitionally. We know that dt over little dt, or d, d capital T over d little t, that's a mouthful, isn't it? This is simply going to be the magnitude of t, oh, I'm missing all my magnitude stuff here, on it. You guys have really got to yell at me about that. I will get lazy with my magnitude stuff. Magnitude of the rate of change of the unit tangent vector divided by, well, ds over dt was just this guy, right? And we knew that this guy, this guy, was this guy. True? So this is just going to be r primed of t, the magnitude of that, which is kind of a nice way to work with it. Now, I'm going to give you two more formulas for curvature, and you're going to prove these algebraically and robustly for extra credit. So remind me to give you extra credit for this, and we'll we'll define how that's done. Right, this is because this one's kind of gnarly. Another, they're they're both kind of interesting, but the second one's awful. It's the magnitude of r primed of t. Remember that's just our vector valued function crossed with r double primed of t. <laughs> right? <laughs> You're like, where is this coming from? Divide a bar by, excuse me, r primed of t, this magnitude, which isn't all that scary, cubed. Huh? Well, I want you to figure out how it's done. Once you have this, this one sort of falls out. Now, this is just for vectors, vectors in the plane or in two space, three space with the parameter, vectors in the plane. This guy is just defined as the magnitude of f double prime of x or the absolute value of it, right? As soon as we get away from, from vectors, divided by the quantity one plus f prime of x, f prime of x squared, and then to the three halves. Boy, that's a mouthful, isn't it? So these two are gonna be extra credit that you're gonna prove robustly. You can use the textbook or you can go online, you can figure stuff out that way. I, I, I don't care which, all right? But that'll be fun for you guys and an opportunity to get a little extra credit on homework. All right, now that we got curvature out of the way, let's talk about normal or unit normal and binormal, binormal vectors. Okay, so here we, oops, vectors. All right, so here we go again. You ready? Here's my thing dingy. Here's x. Here's y. Here's z. Here's my curve. Let's just do it that it's passing through space. All right, now, here's my unit tangent right here, okay? Vector, now that's, so that's theoretically one unit long. Now what I want is, because we dealt with, with orthogonal or normal vectors in the plane before, but what I want to do here is I want to come up with a unit normal vector to this curve passing through space. Now there's a whole bunch of different um, orthogonal vectors, but you got to think about this be, depending on the behavior of this curve, right? This remember how we called this C, the set of points of the curve. Depending on the, how that thing's behaving, like if it's swirling up, then I want to make sure that my unit normal vector is actually normal to both the unit tangent line and to the curve itself. So I'm going to have let's see, I need a good color. Let's do this one. This thing's going to bust down at a right angle here, all right? But remember, this thing has to be, this, this unit normal curve, or excuse me, vector, has to be perpendicular to both the tangent, the unit tangent vector, and the curve itself. So that's gonna dictate where it goes. That's gonna dictate, like this thing could swivel through 360 degrees and still be orthogonal to the red one, but it wouldn't be perpendicular or orthogonal to the behavior of the curve at that point in time at t. So what I'm going to use to come up with this normal, this unit normal vector is the fact that I know that if the magnitude of r of t is equal to a constant, if this is true, this implies that r of t dotted with its derivative is always equal to zero and thus these two vectors are orthogonal to one another. Now you may say, well, Ripley, what are you doing? Well, look at this, watch. I know that the magnitude of t of t, by definition, it's a unit vector. I know that this guy is equal to one, which implies that t of t, dotted with its own derivative, has got to be zero, right? So t primed of t is orthogonal to t. 
All right, by, we're guaranteed that by this piece of information that we've shown before, which implies if I want n of t, which is the unit normal vector, that's the normal guy, right? All I have to do is take the vector that is normal to t, which is t primed of t, and divide it by the magnitude of t primed of t. Now, why do I have to do that? Why do I have to take that magnitude? Well, remember, we like unit vectors. We love unit vectors. And the way to get from a vector to the unit vector is to simply divide by its magnitude. All right? Remember, when I and I have to do this still to this day. When I see these vertical lines that look like absolute values, in my head, I think magnitude of a vector. I'm going to get a scalar out of this thing when everything is said and done. Now, let's talk about the, bino the, excuse me, the binormal vector. Binormal vector, the way I think about it, is bi means two, normal means perpendicular to. So the way that I think of it is bi the binormal vector, and this is going to be very, very difficult to draw here, but it's a vector, it's a, a unit vector, it's a unit vector that's popping out, that's perpendicular to both the unit tangent vector and the unit normal vector. Well, that's pretty easy to get to, right? I'm just, all I have to do, how do I do that? How do I get, how do I generate a vector that is perpendicular to two other vectors where their tails are touching? Well, hopefully you see cross product in that. So I know that B of T, this is the unit binormal. And you don't have to say unit. You can just say binormal vector is just the unit tangent vector crossed with the unit normal vector. And that's it. Now, this is mostly just vocab, but you are going to have some formulas in here that you're going to have to um, at least have at your fingertips. I'm not saying you're going to have to memorize all of them, and I will tell you the formulas that you absolutely have to memorize. But you are going to have, have to understand what the vocab is because it's going to pop up again, and you're definitely going to have to be able to utilize the formulas. All right, that's it for 13.3. Hope you enjoyed it. I'll talk to you soon. See you tomorrow.